I think in all of the um, all of the presentations that we've done, all of the seminars that we've done, the most moving and the most um, I think powerful information comes from this panel because it's actually the people who have gone through it. And I think many people don't understand um, the story of the surrogate mother until they actually hear it from her lips. And we're very, very lucky to have two amazing uh, women with us today, two amazing fathers with us today. We have Arthur Pace, who's uh, a husband, Baptiste. You've seen their their child, most beautiful child in the world, running around over here. They're proud parents of a 10-month-old uh, girl through gestational surrogacy, and they live in the Netherlands. In France? Oh, sorry. Um, Last-minute substitution. Uh, we have Stacy Ash, who's a surrogate mother. Uh, she's carried uh, three sets of twins for three families, including Mark and his husband, Joris, from the Netherlands. Okay, I knew there was a Netherlands in there, thank you. Uh, uh, Mark Faber and Joris, a Dutch couple, uh, who had twins through gestational surrogacy and are a part of the organization Meer de Gevens. And finally, Colleen Iverson, who is a mother of three from Connecticut and has been a surrogate twice. Uh, and uh, she currently um, works, at, Colleen, do you still work at, for, at Fertility Clinic? So we'll get the names straight. And what I would like if, um, uh, if Arthur, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask each of you to speak for a few minutes about your story, uh, and then uh, uh, and and then we'll open it up for some questions from you all. Uh, uh, if, if we can keep the questions, please, uh, primarily from the attendees, that would be wonderful. But uh, um, this is Arthur Pace. Should I talk into yeah. This? Yes, please. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Men Having Babies, for holding this event. Uh, it's amazing to see so many people out here, and I think it's very important that these events are being held. So thank you very much for taking the trouble of uniting all these people and sharing the information and bringing legal experts out, bringing medical experts out. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Thank you also the two translators who are having a very hard time today translating everything uh, and for all the volunteers who work to make this event a smooth one, an informative one, and a high quality one. So I wanted to start off with saying thank you for that. Um, so uh, as you said exactly, I'm a proud parent of the most gorgeous girl in the world uh, who was born through uh, gestational surrogacy. I'm Dutch, hence the uh, the incomprehension there. Uh, I live in Paris with my husband, Baptiste, and uh, we started thinking about parenthood in 2009. Uh, we explored different possibilities you have as a, as a same-sex gay couple, um, being a co-parenting, adoption, and surrogacy. And um, each way of becoming a parent has its drawbacks and its advantages. Uh, we finally ended up uh, going through uh, surrogacy. Adoption was difficult at that time uh, because of gay marriage not being legalized yet in France. In the, in the meantime, it has been legalized, so it was difficult to do an adoption as a couple. We had, we had to adopt a single person, so that didn't really work, uh, that didn't really fit our needs. Uh, Co-parenting, it's very difficult to find suitable uh, co-parents as well, and I don't think I qualify as a suitable co-parent at all. Um, so that led us to, uh, to surrogacy. Um, what is there to say? I'm Dutch and in Holland uh, surrogacy is legal, uh, provided that it respects a certain number of rules, uh, which makes it very difficult to find uh, a surrogate in Holland. We tried for two years. Uh, we didn't succeed in finding someone who would carry a baby for us, and so we moved on to plan B. Plan B was to do it in the United States. And in the United States, we had a very, well, classical, even though we were lucky, though, but it was a very classical um, thing, finding an agency, uh, the agency finding a surrogate, an egg donor, um, us finding a clinic as well. And well, from that point on, basically things went very smoothly. Uh, we were lucky to have the surrogate we had. Uh, I think Stacy will kind of explain her, uh, her point of view on doing surrogacy. I think that 
I don't understand why surrogates do it. I think they're a bit crazy as well doing it, <laughs> carrying children for other people because it's a lot to do. Egg donors as well. I mean, it's kind of a discomfortable uh, procedure for them as well. But I don't care if they're crazy or not because as long as they do it and they're happy with it, <laughs> I know that I was happy uh, being surrounded by the two generous persons who, uh, who made it all possible for us. Um, what can I say about it? It's a, um, a difficult procedure. Uh, it's a, an expensive procedure as well uh, to do surrogacy. Um, but I think that if you're lucky enough to uh, have a go at it and have a try, uh, try to, do, uh, to become a parent, because you never know if it's really going to work or not. Agencies will tell you that they have enormous success rates in clinics too, and I don't doubt that, but you never really know. It's not, it's not a mechanical uh, thing. It, it works or it doesn't work. We were lucky that after, uh, after one, well, we did two tries, actually two transfers. The second transfer worked. And, I mean, it's fantastic being a parent. It really is. So uh, for each and one, every prospective parent out here today, I really, you know, if you have the opportunity to try to become a parent, become a parent because it's fantastic. I really, uh, I must say. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, let's, uh, let's hear from Stacy and, uh, and tell us about your, uh, your experience with Mark and yours. Sure. Um. And if you could speak into the microphone for the translators. Yes. So I'm from the US, from South Carolina. I actually have two biological children of my own and an adopted daughter from China and had the opportunity to carry for three different couples, um, a set of twins each time. Two from the States, um, both heterosexual couples and then the international, Mark and Yoris, um, for the last time. And it's really, an incredible experience and um, I do consider myself probably a little bit crazy because you know it is it is different and people ask you know how do you give up your babies and how and it's a very different experience from my pregnancies with my children and um, I never felt like I was giving up my babies because they were never mine um, but it's been an amazing experience to um, be friends after the fact, and each of my journeys was very different, and I have a very different relationship with each couple. And um, Mark and Yaris, I'm probably the closest to them um, as I am any of the couples, which is ironic because they're the farthest away. But um, it's been amazing, it really has been, and um, it's really kind of an extended family. You know, I don't consider them, of course, they're not my children, but it's wonderful to be able to be a part of it and to see them now and um, to get to know them as they grow up and get to see them grow up. And the other couples that I worked with, um, like I said, we have a very different experience. One couple, I get a Christmas card each year from them, and that's the only communication we have. And the other couple, we, we talk some, but with Mark and Yaris, I've been very close with them. And, of course, I've had the opportunity to come here, which has been incredible. And it's nice for me to be able to, I can't carry any more babies because my body says no. And because um, I would probably do it 10 more times if I could. It was such an amazing experience. But, um, but it's nice for me to be able to do something like this because I know there's a lot of negative um, views of surrogacy. And in the United States, it's very different. I still was looked on as very different and very odd for wanting to do it but it was very accepted and I truly had nothing but positive reactions to doing it, which was wonderful. And which was a little surprising because I live in the South and people are very conservative and so I expected to have some negative views, but I really didn't. My family was very supportive and my family loves them. My parents were so excited that I got to come over here and they always ask about the babies and they always want to see pictures and they always want to know what's going on. So it's been really wonderful that my family has really embraced it and, and just love it. And my children, who are 11 and 8, my boys, and then my daughter is 4, they truly think that it's totally normal because I started, I had the first set of twins in 2008 and so they were quite young. And for them, they look at it as this is what people do. If somebody can't have babies, somebody else has them for them. And so for them, it's completely normal. And they are very, they have, it, I think has really helped them 
become very open-minded for things. You know, through the adoption of my daughter, it was very normal to them too that families are just made in different ways. And so I think it's been an amazing experience for them as well to see that there's all these different ways to make a family. And I think it's, it's been really good for all of us. And um, just an amazing experience to get to see the parents hold their babies for the first time or you know, see them now when I see the kids, they're two and a half, and just to see them as parents and see them growing up so happy and just so wonderful, it makes it all very worthwhile. All of the aches and pains of pregnancy and you know, swollen ankles and things like that makes it totally worthwhile. And yes, we probably are a little crazy, but um, all of that, I will never, ever, ever forget the first couple that I carried for. They had a daughter um, that was born very early, and so they weren't able to hold her when she was first born. And I, I delivered the babies before they got to the hospital, and they were there. And um, when they got there, they just kind of looked at them. And I said, you know you can hold them. Because with their first child, they didn't have that experience of getting to hold them right away. And it was amazing to see their faces, and they both just broke down in tears, and I was crying, and it was just amazing to see them hold them the first time. It was incredible, and that's when I knew at that point I would probably do it again because selfishly, it makes you feel really good. <laughs> so there is, I mean, I, I get a lot of people saying, I can't believe that you would do that for someone else, but there's so much that I got out of it. There's so much, just, it's just amazing. And, you know, having friends now across the world and it just, it very much for both sides, I think, um, it's a really amazing experience. It, I mean, truly, and just to be a parent, one of the reasons that I wanted to do it to start out with is because I do have two wonderful biological children and had very easy pregnancies, and I can't imagine someone telling me that I couldn't have children because it's been, my kids are absolutely my life, and I can't imagine not having them. So for me, it was something that I could do to help someone else have what I have and be, um, and have that. And so it was an amazing experience to be able to do that for somebody else. Thank you so much, Stacy. I think you're the, the um, exemplification of, uh, uh, of what some people don't understand and, and a, a very true heart. So thank you. Um, Mark, tell us about, uh, from the intended parent's point of view, tell us about what your journey was like. Uh, yeah, I'm from Holland and my English is not so good as the rest of us, <laughs> so I point uh, a few things on, the, on my uh, iPad. Um, but first of all, she is really amazing and I almost cried again <laughs> if she tells this. So I try to get it clear. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, for gay men, it's more and more accept accepted that they are getting children, but most of the time they are getting uh, children by co-parenting. Um, so also, uh, yours and I first started with co-parenting because that's the common thing to get a, a, a parent as a, as a gay man. Uh, so we met a girl, uh, she was uh, at the end of the 30s, and uh, she was heterosexual, and we got, uh, got to know each other for more than a year, because you have to know each other because you're, together you have one family. Um, uh, but after a year, she decided uh, uh, to go to a bar and get pregnant over there, and the story was over. Uh, so that was very hard for us at that, at that time. Um, after that, uh, we, in the meanwhile, we also uh, tried to do the adoption process, and in the adoption process, it was uh, um, uh, we finished uh, after two years the a sort of license to, to get to that you may adopt a child, and we could adopt two childs. Um, but after you get the license in Holland, it's, uh, you have to wait for some about six years uh, for getting a child. And um, uh, it depends on uh, what kind of um, special needs you uh, want to have, or you can handle. Uh, so you get a, a, a large list of all special needs which you have to say, yes, I can, or yes, or, or no, I can't. And uh, after that, we got the list. We couldn't fill in all those things. So uh, 
if we if we should, then it would be at least that you have a child with uh, two special needs and will be a two-year-old uh, child, <clears throat> and that's what yeah we we wanted a, a baby. Uh, uh, we prefer that. So after that, we uh, we went again watching on the internet what are the possibilities, and at that time um, I saw that uh, that we always thought that surrogacy was not something for us because we can't imagine that someone is giving their baby away. Um, but when we saw on the internet that in the United States there is an egg donor and a carrier and they are two different women, it assumed that it's, <laughs> that's my son, um, <laughs> it uh, assumed it's, it's um, uh, yeah, we, think, we thought that it's maybe possible to get a children. We can imagine that that someone is get, giving their, her eggs away because sperm donors are, there are a lot of sperm donors in Holland. So an egg donor, that's a little bit harder, but I can imagine a woman will do that. And carrying a baby was also, I thought maybe some woman will do that. <laughs> and uh, so uh, after that, we, we signed a, a contract. Uh, at that time, there were no big conferences like this, only I know of the, the agencies of grown, uh, grown Generations and Circle at that time. Uh, so we signed up at Circle and um, uh, we met our first surrogate and it didn't went well. After three times we didn't get pregnant. Uh, it was very hard after three times to decide uh, how to go further because every time yeah, the money is going to, uh, uh, the money box is going to be empty uh, uh, after time after time after time. So after three times we decided to, uh, to, uh, we, uh, to change the, uh, uh, the surrogate mom. It was very hard because you get a very good relation with the surrogate. Uh, so it was very hard to change the surrogate mom. Um, but at that time we met Stacy and uh, uh, <laughs> it went well, very well from, from the beginning. Uh, and we also changed the, the embryos, so the egg donor, because our new clinic was uh, said that the embryos weren't very, very good. So we started over all again. Um, so that was, um, uh, that was our sec second journey. Uh, and after um, uh, the first time we went pregnant with uh, Lola and Flint. So we met at the time, first we met Stacy, uh, um, uh, in the States when we were there on holiday. Uh, we met her after, I think, two or three months. We went back for the uh, making the embryos and the transfer. Mm -hmm. And after, uh, at the 20 weeks uh, ultrasound, we also went back. Uh, and we, I know that we saw there, it was a girl and a boy. And Stacy was sleeping and her husband was sleeping while, <laughs> while the ultrasound was What's more excited for us than for you, I think. Um, uh, and we went back for the, uh, for the delivery, of course. Um, in, the, the lessons learned for us was, uh, we, because we did it two times, uh, and to, to de decrease the, the amount of money, it's, um, uh, we looked for a clinic nearby, uh, the, the, nearby Stacy. The first time it was different. The, the circuit lives in California, and the clinic was uh, nearby Boston. So that was you have to pay for the uh, for the travel, and you have to pay for the hotel uh, for the surrogate, and you have to pay for uh, the childcare if they have, if, she, if she has children. Uh, you have to pay uh, for a day uh, if every day she stays there, uh, an amount for food, and so it's much more. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, less expensive to to have a clinic, and it's also very very, uh, very easy for the surrogate. She was very happy we we choose a clinic nearby because otherwise you have to travel a lot and be away of your children. Um, um, yeah, maybe something about the egg donor. Um, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we decided uh, in Holland it's. It's real common that for sperm donors, it's, uh, you have to, um, uh, yeah, there are only known sperm donors in the official way. 
uh, that's also in the in the law of Holland. So we thought it's it's important also for our children that if they want to meet their biologic mother uh, in future, uh, they can do that. So we put in the in the contract. It's not very common in the United States, but we put it in the in the contract that after 16 years, if Lola and Flint will uh, meet them, meet her, then uh, it's a possibility. She, they don't have to, but the possibility uh, there is. Uh, and we think that's, yeah, they can choose. It's important to know things about the past, where they are from, where they, where they are from. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next speaking is gonna be Colleen Iverson. She has been a surrogate twice, and she also has a really um, special perspective on this because she's been, uh, had worked at a fertility clinic, and I think possibly, and I was gonna ask this question of you later on if nobody else asked it, but uh, if you can, from your own perspective, in your own experience, address some of the concerns that I think a lot of people in Europe may have about the treatment of surrogate mothers and what's, what's, what's done to create support st systems for them and then what your personal experience was like with that. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna be using my notes. I hope you don't mind. Uh, my name's Colleen Iverson. I work as a surrogacy coordinator on the CT fertility team and I I'm a happily married mother of three amazing children and I'm a proud two-time gestational surrogate. I'm often asked how I came to the decision to become a surrogate I've worked in infertility for over 20 years, so I entered into my journey fully knowledgeable about the entire surrogacy process. As is the case with most of the surrogates that I meet, we all seem to share one common denominator, and that is knowing a friend or a family member who cannot have a child on their own. For me, they just happen to be patients of CT fertility. Sam and Mark were the parents of the baby girls that I delivered in April 2009 and May 2011. My story is a bit unique in the sense that I met my couple when they were patients of CT fertility, and through my time as their coordinator, we had developed a friendship. Sam and Mark had been trying to have a baby without success, while I had recently given birth to my youngest child. After witnessing their struggle, I was compelled to offer to become their surrogate. I knew that pregnancy was something that I was legitimately good at, and at that point in my life, my own family was complete. I was at the right point in my life, so my decision to do this came easily. Before I made such a huge de decision, I called my husband, who I, I will say was quite shocked, and he did think that I was crazy, since I had never mentioned the fact um, that I wanted to become a surrogate. Uh, once he realized that I was serious, we both knew that we need, needed to make the decision together. Through my work, I knew what I was getting into, and I had seen the dynamics between surrogates and their intended parents, but he really had no idea. I printed lots of information for him, I printed a sample legal contract, um, and after he reviewed it, he said, let's do this. My reason for bringing this up is to tell you that this is not just a personal decision, but rather a family decision during this journey. At the time of my first surrogacy, my children were very young. My two uh, oldest children were ages seven and three, and my youngest child was six months old. The pregnancy was easy for me, and it had, as it had been with my own children. And um, I tried my best to keep the parents as informed about every appointment, about every kick that the baby was making, um, uh, because they, uh, just to keep them um, a part, a huge part of the process. Um, so, uh, sorry. On delivery day, they were in the room and they greeted their daughter as she made her way into the world. Witnessing their faces when they met their baby girl is a moment forever etched in my mind. I had offered to carry a sibling for them, so we began our second journey within the year. This journey took a little longer than the first, but we persevered and eventually became pregnant. The pregnancy was going well until the baby decided to make a dramatic appearance during my son's school dance, which he has still not forgiven me for. 
Um, and again, like the first journey, the moment that that baby that I carried for all those months was finally in the arms of her parents, it made the whole experience worth it. I had explained things to my children in very simple terms. I told them that the doctor was going to place Sam and Mark's baby into my stomach since I'm very good at growing babies. Then, when she was done growing, I would go to the hospital, get the baby out, give her back to Sam and Mark, and to this day, my kids still refer to me as a baby grower. I know that many have questions about compensation. I didn't do this for financial gain. I did this because I'm legitimately good at being pregnant and I wanted to help this couple. My first surrogacy was uncompensated. Going into the second journey, the parents and I had many conversations about compensation. They felt like compensating me was their token of appreciation to my family for helping them become parents, and it made them feel better to be in control of the financial aspect. So we all agreed that we would include compensation in our second arrangement. I will add that one of the biggest misconceptions about surrogates is that they will decide that they don't want to give up the baby. That is the furthest thing from the truth. My family and I went into this knowing that our family was complete. I didn't have an emotional attachment to either baby. The best way for me to describe the feeling is that I love them, I want what's best for them, but I think of them as I think of my best friend's children. It's nice to visit with them, but I would never want to keep what wasn't mine to begin with. I best describe my experience as being a nine-month nanny. At the end of nine months, my job had ended. Sam, Mark, and the children now live eight hours from me, but we keep in touch often through pictures and text messages, and we have even taken vacations together. As the girls get older, they refer to me as Aunt Colleen. So in closing, I will say that when I look back at the best moments of my life, along with my wedding day and the birth of my three kids, the birth of Madeline and Viv Vivian will remain at the top of my list. I loved being a surrogate and I was honored to be a surrogate. Knowing that I have forever changed the lives of one family has awarded me so much joy and fulfillment. I wish each of you the best on your own journey to towards parenthood. Thank you. I feel very much like Mark. I've done this panel so many times and I get emotional every time that I hear this story. So thank you so much for coming uh, and making this real for us. Um, I want to open it up to, to some questions um, from the audience, uh, but I do want to ask, I think, a question that maybe many of us are having from um, Stacy and Colleen. What do you look for in, 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 in an intended parent, in someone who you, can, you think that you can work with? What is it, what are the, the, the traits, what's the instinct that you have, you know, when, when you have that first conversation? Um, I think for me, it was just kind of an innate connection. I think um, with each of the parents, I have a different relationship, but there's an instant connection. Like when you meet somebody for the first time and you know that you're going to be friends and you know um, that you feel comfortable with them. And I think being able to communicate with them is very, very important because this is such a personal and intimate thing that you go through together and um, <clears throat> definitely being able to communicate with each other. But I really think that it was just a, a feeling of this is the right thing to do. Um, and of course you want to, one of the things with all three couples is that I felt like their relationship together was very strong. And that's kind of, you know, I'm obviously not the parent of these children, but I want them to grow up in a very happy, healthy environment. So that was very important to me that they had um, a very strong relationship and you know, would just be able to provide this amazing life for the children. I agree. For, for my couple, um, I knew how badly they wanted this. And, um, and I, like I said, I had already developed a connection with them. So, um, when you know, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how it was in my situation, Excellent. yeah. Did um, either of you feel at any point in the journey like that you weren't supported or that you 
th there was something that was lacking for you? Did, or did you experience, I, I, I'm assuming you both did it through agency representation, did you experience support from the agency and you understood what the process was like? They explained it to you carefully. Can you exp just talk for a moment about that? Yes, my um, agency, I would have check-in, um, emails, calls, at least once a month, um, always got questions answered, and they were very, wanted to make sure emotionally that I was okay, and I went through the same agency each time, and so by the third time, there wasn't, there weren't as many phone calls and as many emails, because I kind of, I guess, they assumed I knew what I was doing, and was okay with it at that point. But um, there was a lot of explaining, you know, this is how it's going to happen and this is, is how it's going to work and doing the contracts and things like that. They were very good um, at explaining everything to make sure because they truly wanted me to understand everything and feel comfortable with everything. And I never had a point where I didn't feel like I was supported, really. So it was, it was good to have. And I like the comfort of the agency because I know there were background checks done and things like that and most of the legal things and conversations that are difficult to have um, between the surrogate and the intended parents, they were kind of the go-between, which was nice because there are a lot of conversations that are a little more difficult and things that need to be discussed um, as far as what will happen with pregnancies and, and the, the compensation and things like that that they wanted us to focus on our relationship. And so they handled and went as the go-between for that, which was very nice because it allowed us to just build a relationship and build a friendship, which made the journey so much better. And, and you had legal representation in entering yes. into the contract. Yes, you, absolutely. Colleen, did you feel that support also? Um, my situation was a little different because we um, had an independent arrangement. Um, since we had an established relationship, um, we decided to, we had legal representation, obviously, but, um, but we, we were able to navigate difficult situations um, because of the relationship that we had, and we were very lucky in that sense. Um, but I do agree that agencies um, definitely give you that support that, that you need um, for navigating difficult circumstances that come up. Um, before we get going, I'm going to open the floor to questions, but I just want to um, first thank the press that has come in to, uh, to tell the story. I hope that you've learned uh, something new, and I hope that you can help explain this story from a different perspective. Um, and for the sake of expediency, the press aspect of the, uh, of the um, seminar is closed. And if you could go outside, I believe that there's going to be a dedicated press area for people if you want to uh, uh, interview people. Uh, but now, if you could please go ahead and exit the room into the back. There'll be somebody in the back who will assist you uh, with the next phase of talking to people. Thank you. Um, so tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about, tell me, uh, before we open up to questions, I have one more question, which I think is fascinating for um, Colleen and Stacey. I'm sorry I'm mon monopolizing Arthur and Mark, but I, I, I want to hear. <laughs> what were your husband's um, experiences in the journey? And what were, you, Mark and Arthur, what were your relationships with their families? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, my husband thought I was crazy. Um, but um, he supported me through the entire process, and that was key for my situation. Um, he needed to watch my children when I had doctor's appointments. Um, I was in the hospital for two weeks um, on hospital bed rest and uh, didn't have anyone else to watch my children and my husband was there to do that. So I think that my, um, my parents um, would agree that my husband was as instrumental in, uh, this, in our surrogacy um, as the rest of us were. Um, I think when I first started, I actually looked into egg donation before my second son was born. And, you know, being on the Internet, I'm sure you all have searched, it all kind of comes together, the egg donation and the adoption and the surrogacy all kind of comes up together when you search things. And that's how I started, was looking into that, and then got pregnant with um, my 8-year-old. And so 
after being pregnant with him, I did a lot of thinking and a lot of searching and realized that I felt like I had more of a connection to my eggs and didn't feel comfortable donating. And then thought, well, I have these great pregnancies. Let me think about being a surrogate. So I approached the subject with my husband, and I'm pretty sure he thought it was something that would go away, that it was just this fleeting idea that I had, um, and that I would get over it, and we would move on and not do anything crazy. And, um, but it kind of, it stayed in my mind, and I just could not let it go. I felt like it was really something that I really wanted and needed to do. And um, after he realized it wasn't going away, he was very supportive, and he has has a wonderful relationship because he was really, like when I, I remember when I was in labor, he was calling the parents and saying, this is where we're at, this is what's going on, and you know, because um, that's not a point when you really wanna talk to people on the phone. And um, so he really, and just like Colleen said, with watching the kids and being at appointments, he was at ultrasounds with me, and I could not have done it without him there because, you know, just a marriage in general, he's my other half. And it was very important for me that, that he was okay with it and that he was supportive because, like she said, it really is a family decision because it affects everybody. You know, even my children, you know, when you're going to all these doctor's appointments, it does take time and it takes energy. And by the end of pregnancy, when you're, I was pregnant with twins each time, you know, you move a little slower and you can't do quite as much. And so everybody really was involved and I was very, very lucky that he was okay with it. And he, um, he actually, I did an interview with the newspaper this past week and um, he answered some questions about it and I was reading what he had answered and he said he knew after the first time I did it, when he saw my face, seeing the parent's face, he said I knew she would do it over and over and over again if she could. <laughs> so he was, he was very supportive. I think that he did get nervous because there's of course the medical risk that goes along with it and um, I was in the hospital for two weekends with the last pregnancy and I was, got fairly sick at the end of it and I think he got very nervous because of course, you know, um, there is that risk involved with it. Um, and so I think at this point, you know, like I said, I can't do it again. And I think he's a little bit happy about that because he did get nervous at the end of it that something was gonna happen. But I could not have done it without him completely being on board with it. And let's face it, we're really, we get moody. Oh yeah. We get moody and mm -hmm. they have to deal with our crankiness. <laughs> yes. And, yes. Um, and our cravings. Uh -huh. um, so it's important. <laughs> uh, yeah. Often uh, uh, un, un, unlooked at part of this journey. Does anybody have questions uh, from the audience? Yes. <laughs> and if you, I'll, I'll repeat it just if you speak English. So the question is, um, what are the key features of the personality traits of an independent surrogate? Um, I, I I'm assuming, I, uh, uh, as opposed to someone working with an agency, like how you can find somebody and... So like, I understand your background as well, so that could give us all like, a, what, what do you need in your mind to, to be really able to do so? Well, you want someone who's had healthy pregnancies, obviously. Um, usually we look for somebody under the age of 40. Um, and someone that's doing it for the right reasons, and that's really hard to know from the beginning. You really, if you're going into an independent surrogacy, you really need to get to know the person that's gonna be carrying your baby. Yes, one more question and then we're gonna, we actually uh, did a little adjusting with the schedule because we wanna do the um, first introductions of our gold and platinum sponsors so you get an idea of who you're gonna be meeting up in the expo room, which we're gonna direct you to in a little bit. Um, but let's have one last question, yes. Thanks, I love all the stories. But, uh, my question is that although you have say that mostly your pregnancy was fine and was mostly comparable to your uh, the pregnancy of your own, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if uh, this change that is always uh, hormonal and uh, very difficult to handle made you emotionally 
different uh, in the two, two different pregnancies, one with your own uh, child and the other one with the uh, babies. Emotionally, which is actually the intense difference that you feel. Or it's just that you feel relieved because this, you, you are not so anxious like your own pregnancy. So the question was, were there emotional differences differences that she experienced in having her own children than she had in having um, children for intended parents? Um, definitely a different, definitely different. Um, when I was pregnant with my own children, I thought about it every minute of every day. And I wanted to decorate baby rooms, and I wanted to buy clothes, and I, I wanted to do all of the nesting kind of things to get ready. Um, when I was pregnant with the other pregnancies, it really was, um, from the beginning, a separation between my mind and my body almost. And I was physically pregnant, and I did everything I needed to do, but I didn't think about it all the time. And when I did think about it, it was, oh yeah, I'm carrying these babies. But it never, there, there really wasn't an emotional connection. And now, um, like, like she said, being like a best friend's kid, I think of it almost as like my nieces and nephews. You love them, but not like a mother because there's that so intense motherly love with your children. And I love them and I want them to do well and I hope that they're happy and healthy. And I love to see them and spend time with them, but they're not mine and they never were mine. And I, never, and I think that's a very important from the very, very beginning, the mindset of they're not yours. Truly, you are just carrying them until they're big enough to go to their parents. And I think that is probably, I have people that tell me I could never do that. And I think you probably shouldn't because it's not something, sorry, um, it's not something that everybody I think could do because I don't think, a lot of people I don't think could make the separation. And I think that is the key in all of it. And, and, being able to say, yes, I'm just carrying these until they're big enough to go to their parents. And I never felt a motherly love for them. So I completely agree. Please give a round of applause to Arthur, to Colleen, to Mark, and to Stacy for telling their story.